survive. But with worldwide population growth and increased fossil fuel consumption, we're now putting out more CO2 than our trees and plants can absorb. And since CO2 is a greenhouse gas, there are fears that all this carbon dioxide is heating up our planet. For some, the solution is obvious. Correspondent Peter Standring met up with some inventors trying to design a very green machine, one that can make like a tree. In a warehouse on the outskirts of Tucson, Arizona, Professor Klaus Lackner has come up with an idea even he admits is a bit fantastic. He's attempting to compete with Mother Nature. We're trying to mimic what a tree can do, and these are the leaves of that tree. Mimic a tree? Some people would say this can't possibly be done, but then on the other hand, every tree can do it. Every tree, in fact, every leaf, is like a tiny factory taking in carbon dioxide from the air and using it to make the energy it needs to survive. In the process, it releases the oxygen that we need to live. Klaus's version of a tree also pulls carbon dioxide out of the air, not for its own survival, but to help us fight global warming. Sounds pretty incredible? Well, so is the way he came up with the idea. It all started a decade ago when his 12-year-old daughter, Claire, came to him for advice. When I started to think about this problem, I was looking for ways of doing experiments. And just about that time, uh, Claire came to me in the study at home and said she is looking for an experiment to do for her science fair. I was in middle school, and I had to do a science experiment for my science class. And so I talked to my dad about various ideas, and he suggested this. And I said, why don't you pull CO2 out of the atmosphere? Pull carbon dioxide out of the air? A tall order for a little girl. But as the daughter of a renowned scientist, Claire already knew about global warming. She understood that when sunlight enters the atmosphere and strikes the Earth's surface, some of it is reflected back towards space in the form of heat. Greenhouse gases like CO2, carbon dioxide, work like a chemical blanket to trap heat and keep the planet nice and warm. But the increased burning of fossil fuels was generating so much carbon dioxide that our planet's temperature appeared to be rising at an alarming rate. But how could you just pull CO2 out of the air? Claire had an innovative idea. I went to the local pet shop and bought a fish pump. All right, there you go. Thank Have a you. good day. You too. I fill the test tube with sodium hydroxide. Next, I attach the fish pump to the test tube, turned it on, and ran air through it all night. As Claire slept, her experiment was hard at work. The fish pump was forcing air containing a small percentage of CO2 into the test tube. CO2 is an acid like vinegar. Sodium hydroxide, the liquid in the test tube, is a base kind of like baking soda, but stronger, a lot stronger. It's made of lye, the nasty stuff that cleans out your drain. When acids and bases meet, they not only attract, but they bind to each other. It's called an acid-base reaction. So the carbon dioxide binds to the sodium hydroxide and leaves the air. Claire succeeded in capturing carbon dioxide straight from the air, won a prize at the science fair, and change the course of her father's life. I was surprised that she pulled this off as well as she did, which made me feel that it could be easier than I thought. The first sketch I made ended up looking like a tuning fork or a gold post with Venetian blinds. A far cry from Mother Nature's design. The first reaction of most people is, why take CO2 out of the air where it's more dilute than in any other place? Clearly, it must be easier to get it out of a power plant. But not all of the CO2 comes out of a power plant. A lot comes from cars, trucks, and airplanes burning fuel. Once in the air, CO2 is very dilute, making the idea of capturing it sound close to impossible. If Klaus was going to make this far-out idea a reality, he was going to need some practical advice. If you look at Claire's experiment, what she had is a test tube. So he went to the Wright brothers, not Orville and Wilbur, but project manager and engineer Alan and Burton, 
another set of brothers who, like their namesakes, don't shy away from a challenge. The Wright brothers were able to look at a bird in flight. So they knew it was possible to fly. So it does the fluttering of the leaf. Klaus and I will look at a tree and say, well, you know, that tree is capturing carbon dioxide out of the air. We know it can be done. You've got to figure out how to do it. Not just in the laboratory with a tiny fish pump and a test tube, but on a global scale. In 2004, they form a private company called GRT. But the transition from a child science fair project to the first synthetic tree is filled with obstacles. One in particular could stop them dead in their tracks. Their tree needs electricity to run, and whenever you produce electricity, by burning oil, gas, or coal, you also produce carbon dioxide. It's called an energy penalty. If their synthetic tree produces more CO2 to run than it can capture, well, what's the point? A delicate balancing act begins. For every choice the team makes, there is a price to pay, an energy penalty. Can they somehow reduce the amount of energy they use? We needed to come up with a shape where you don't have to have an aquarium fish pump driving all the air through the system, but to have the wind just deliver the air and pass it through the collector. It all comes down to geometry. What is the size and shape of the perfect synthetic leaf, one that can remove the most CO2 from the air? To find out, they construct a wind tunnel to study how air moves around and through a variety of surfaces. The easier it is to get air through, the more CO2 we can collect. We tried an array of strings. We tried screens. We tried vertical plates of solid material that were smooth. We tried vertical plates that had a knobby surface. With each attempt, they measure the air pressure in the wind tunnel. A drop in pressure means the airflow has stopped, and that sample has failed. 19. So this is not the answer. It takes a year to find a shape that lets enough air pass through. Perfect. It turns out to be long, flat sheets. The air would move through with very little resistance. It worked well. So air can move through their man-made leaves, but how will they capture CO2? At first, they follow Claire's lead, coating the leaves with sodium hydroxide. The chemistry is sound, but it's a nasty business. It will be a much tougher job for us. Sodium hydroxide is great to prove that it can be done but it has so many disadvantages. Sodium hydroxide is a very corrosive material. It's not a good idea to get it on your skin. It's very harmful if you were to get it in your eyes. As a practical matter, trying to build a machine that works on sodium hydroxide would force us to use very expensive materials, would drive the cost up significantly. The guys decide to abandon the idea of using sodium hydroxide when they make a startling discovery, this material. Now, exactly what this material is, the guys aren't telling. <laughs> what is it? Do I have your attention? <laughs> we can't tell you. <laughs> Turns out this is where science and commerce collide. Its true identity is proprietary. That is, until their patent comes through. The team claims that this engineered fabric attracts CO2 just like sodium hydroxide, but with none of the pitfalls. Here's how the system works. The nine-foot synthetic tree opens its doors, letting air flow through its leaves, which, thanks to their mystery material, readily absorb carbon dioxide. The leaves are then sprayed to wash the CO2 away for storage. The process does use electricity, but in the future, they hope green power will make the device even more energy efficient. Still, one big question remains. What to do with all that CO2? One option lies miles from civilization. Since 1996, a Norwegian oil company has gotten a lot of practice getting rid of CO2 by pumping it into an aquifer deep beneath the North Sea. The process is called carbon sequestration. But could the carbon leak out? If so, what effect would it have on marine life? Once you've got enough gas under there and it's leaking out, it could become a very serious problem. And how much CO2 can they put down there anyhow? 
I believe in the long term, underground injection will not quite have the capacity we are looking for. So I am looking at another process, which I refer to as mineral sequestration. There's a perfect example of it in New York City, on the campus of Columbia University, underneath a bronze statue of the school alma mater. She is sitting on this pedestal of serpentine rock. This serpentine has absorbed CO2, probably out of rainwater. It's known as geological weathering, and if you wait long enough, that's what will happen to all of the CO2 we make. But it takes hundreds of thousands of years for Mother Nature to pull off geological weathering, and we don't have that long to wait. So Klaus is trying to figure out a way to speed it up in the lab. As for his tree, he now has a working prototype, but many questions remain unanswered. Like, how well will it survive the elements? And who's going to pay for it? Is Klaus's tree too fantastic to be real? You could have said that about the Wright brothers and Thomas Edison. I can't sit here and tell you now that this is going to work. I can tell you now that it would be a terrible mistake not to do the research to find out. I believe that it is impossible to stop people from using the fossil fuels, so we need to develop technologies which allow us to use them without creating environmental havoc on the planet. We are, as a world, changing the climate and changing the Earth, and we need to understand how we're changing it and understand what we can do either to fix it or to control how we change it.